Hey, what's up you guys? Welcome back to my channel. I just want to thank you for joining me in part two of the Morgan Harrington and Hannah Graham series. In case you haven't already seen Morgan's video, you may want to go and check that out first. Otherwise, you may be a little lost in some of the references in this video, especially at the end. I'll link it up top and in the description. All right, so let's go ahead and jump right back in. So in the first video, we discussed a brutal assault to a woman I refer to as RG. It happened in Fairfax, Virginia in 2005. The assault occurred when she was walking home from a grocery store, and the woman was actually in the parking lot of her own apartment complex. The assailant repeatedly told her that if she didn't stop screaming and let him do what he wanted to do, that he would kill her. He ran away when a car pulled into the parking lot. DNA evidence was found underneath her fingernails after she scratched him, which would later be linked to the 2009 rape and murder of Morgan Harrington. Morgan vanished from the John Paul Jones Arena, located at the University of Virginia in Charlottesville. Her killer left a trophy behind to be discovered by police, which was a black Pantera shirt, and it happened to contain DNA that matched the first victim's assailant. Approximately three months later, Morgan's body was discovered in a remote field located on a farm, roughly five miles from where she was last seen. She had several fractures, including to her arms, ribs, and skull, and had been sexually assaulted. Though the police had the killer's DNA and a composite sketch, it did not match anyone in their database. So sadly, both cases remained unsolved for several years. That is, until Hannah Graham went missing and ultimately stopped a serial killer in his tracks. Sorry for interrupting, but if you're enjoying this video, please make sure to subscribe, give me a thumbs up, and click the notification bell because I upload every Monday and Friday. You can also follow me on Instagram and Twitter at Casey Shane on YT. I love connecting and interacting with you guys. All right, let's get back to it. Hannah Elizabeth Graham was born to her parents, Sue and John, on February 25th, 1996. They lived in England at the time and decided to move to Fairfax County, Virginia when Hannah was only five years old. She absolutely loved being an American girl and thrived while living here. Her childhood friend Sydney recalls that Hannah truly wanted to be seen as an American. And she was so self-conscious about her English accent that she made an effort to speak normal. During high school, Hannah played the saxophone in the marching band as well as piano. And she was very dedicated. She was also dedicated to her studies and always played by the rules. Once she graduated from high school, Hannah moved from Fairfax County to Charlottesville to attend the University of Virginia. She loved college and all that it had to offer and had actually posted tweets the summer of 2014 about how she could not wait to return her sophomore year. Hannah was described as optimistic and happy and having looked through her Facebook page myself, she was very witty and had a funny personality. In addition to being a good student, she was very extracurricular driven. In fact, Hannah was an excellent softball player and had even become the team captain. Aside from softball, she was also on the university's ski team. Sports, combined with her personable, trusting, and loyal personality, made her a lot of friends. Hannah was also an empath, and she really considered others. She always felt the need to help others as much as she could. In fact, she had spent her summer volunteering to help Habitat for Humanity. At one point before her disappearance, she tweeted that she had helped a girl who was heavily intoxicated to get on the right bus because she was lost and confused. Hannah just really looked out for people, but unfortunately, Many people fail to look out for Hannah on the night of September 12th and the early morning hours of September 13th, 2014. September 12th was a Friday, and Hannah had a pretty average day. She and some of the other girls from her ski team met up to get ready for the evening together around 7 p.m. They had dinner plans with the rest of the team, but the group began drinking when they were getting ready, even though Hannah was only 18 at the time. So they headed to a restaurant called Fig, which was located just across from the university. They enjoyed dinner and left Fig around 11 p.m. At that point, Hannah had been drinking for nearly four hours, but they were excited to continue the night and headed off to a party that was being held at an off-campus apartment in Charlottesville. Once they arrived, Hannah actually ran into one of her friends from high school, 
and they did not stay at that party for very long. That friend told her about yet another party that was happening in another apartment complex, and the pair decided to leave and go there together. The group of friends that she went to the first party with eventually met up with them. But as the night went on, Hannah became increasingly intoxicated and began to not feel well. Because of this, Hannah decided that she needed to leave and go home. One of her friends walked her outside and offered repeatedly to walk her home around midnight, which Hannah unfortunately declined. She said that she would be fine and eventually left on her own. That would be the last time that any of her friends would see her. They did continue to hear from her throughout the night though. And when Hannah left, this is where things get a little bizarre. She left the party and continued to text her friends. It was apparent that she was intoxicated given the context of her text messages. She was misspelling words and honestly, none of them made sense. However, she continued to text them until approximately 1 a.m., at which time all communication ceased. Around 1, she told one of her friends that she was going to another party but got lost and referenced that she was somewhere near 14th and Wortland Street. Right after that, she corrected herself and said she was near 14th Street and the Charlottesville Downtown Mall. The last text that she would send said, I got stuck down though, which I think she meant I got stuck down there meaning she got lost while trying to navigate the mall area. A bouncer working at McGrady's Pub, which is located at the intersection of Grady and Preston Avenue, said that he noticed Hannah walking by him because she had walked by once, turned around, and then walked by him again. He could tell that she was intoxicated and he wanted to make sure that she was okay. So he asked her if she needed any help. Hannah stated that she did not and she left the area, heading east on Preston Avenue toward the mall. Two other witnesses noticed Hannah at the mall as well because a large African-American male had walked up and put his arm around her. They had seen this man lurking around the mall area and he had been to several bars previously that evening, even interacting with the two witnesses as he tried to high five each of them. And one of them thought he was creepy and did not return the high five. The man had also went to several bars in the area that night and was inappropriately touching various women. One of the women had taken her boot off and was rubbing her sore foot when the man approached her, grabbed her foot and began rubbing it, as well as trying to caress her legs. It made her so uncomfortable that she said, get the fuck off me. So anyway, when this man was seen putting his arm around Hannah, one of the witnesses spoke up and said, you don't even know her. Kind of like, why are you being a creepy weirdo, dude? Leave her alone. To which the man told the woman to hush. The two witnesses then followed them after the man convinced Hannah to have a drink with him. They walked to a bar restaurant called Tempo in the mall area. He bought a drink for Hannah and himself, and one of the witnesses actually asked him to buy her a drink as well, which he refused. That was at approximately 1.10 a.m., and Hannah and the man left shortly after. The two witnesses watched as they left together, and the one that thought he was creepy looked at her friend and said, he's going to fuck her up. However, they did not try to follow or help Hannah in any way. This is where things get even more strange. Another witness came forward claiming that they saw Hannah with the man at 4th and Main Street. She was walking several feet ahead of the man and crossed the street at the crosswalk on East Market Street. And that's when the man caught up to her, again, putting his arm around her. The witness felt as if the man came across as unfriendly and intimidating. And even more so when Hannah and the man reached a 1998 orange Chrysler Sebring. The car seemingly belonged to the man because he unlocked the passenger door with his key, opened the door, and then stood in the entryway of the vehicle while Hannah was standing at the back wheel. The witness heard Hannah shriek, I am not getting in the car with you, followed by, it's probably stolen. That witness continued walking toward their car, looking back twice, and listening for anything else to happen. When they got in their vehicle and drove by where the car had been parked, they didn't see the man, Hannah, or the vehicle. However, the witness never called the strange encounter in and never did anything to intervene. The following day, Hannah had plans to volunteer with a group of friends, but she never showed. This was obviously not like her given how responsible she was. Her friends thought it was out of character, but gave her some time to reach out to them. When they still hadn't heard from her the following day, so at this point on Sunday, September 14th, 
They were very, very concerned and alerted her parents, who then reported her missing around 4.30 p.m. They realized then that no one had seen or heard from Hannah since those early morning hours of the 13th, which obviously is every parent's worst nightmare. They were terrified, and Hannah's disappearance spread through the media like wildfire. She played a big role in the community, and police suspected foul play from the very beginning. Morgan Harrington's murder was in the front of everyone's mind. Women were afraid to walk anywhere alone. They were afraid to take their morning and early evening runs because this continued to happen in their community. Police began to pull footage from the night of Hannah's disappearance and thankfully were able to retrace her steps and what she had been doing the moments leading up to her disappearance. Now, this is a lot of information, so I'm gonna try and condense it down a little. Not only that, but there was a lot of conflicting information on specific times. So if you're familiar with this case and I got any of the times wrong, feel free to leave me a comment down below. But anyway, you may really want to pay attention to the next few minutes because a lot transpired in just a couple of hours. At approximately 1 a.m., Hannah is captured on surveillance at a Shell gas station that was located on Preston Avenue, which was just across from her apartment and the UVA campus. You can see her walking just before breaking into a run. However, she does not appear to be in any danger. She's then seen again outside of a place called Sal's Pizza, which is located on East Main Street. In that footage, a white male begins to follow Hannah for a bit. However, he later came forward and told police that he began to follow her because she looked to be in distress and he wanted to make sure that she was safe. Around 1.08 a.m., Hannah is captured on surveillance again at Tools Jewelers, which is also located on East Main Street. It was at that time that the footage shows Hannah walking past an African-American man, at which time he noticed her, turned around, and walked quickly to catch up with her. When he did, that's when he put his arm around her, and that's when the witnesses spotted them together. The two then left to have the drink at Tempo, which was located on 5th Street Southeast. The two are seen on surveillance together there, at which time they stayed approximately 10 to 15 minutes before leaving together. When they left, they were seen walking arm in arm and then turning onto 4th Street. The two are then seen at Red Pump Kitchen at approximately 1.18 a.m., at which time Hannah walks just out of view of the camera. The man follows after her briefly, but then you can see his shadow stop for about 10 seconds. However, we're not sure if Hannah stopped or not. And at that point, that's when the last witness spotted Hannah walking ahead of the man and the pair stopping at the man's car. By September 19th, law enforcement had identified the African-American man in the video to be a man named Jesse Leroy Matthew Jr and they immediately named him as a suspect. When investigators arrived to speak with him about how he was involved with Hannah, Jesse Matthew refused to let them inside and repeatedly told them they could speak with him at the door. I'm not saying that there's anything wrong with this because they did not have a search warrant for his home yet, but dude, that just makes you look suspect even more. So while at his front door, the police asked him about talking to Hannah inside Tempo, at which time he told them he was really drunk and did not remember talking to her, nor did he remember being with her at any point of the night. The police were then basically like, we know you were with her, we have you on video, you need to tell us what happened because she is missing. And Jesse Matthew responded by saying he needed to get some socks. At that time he went inside, closed the door behind him, and put on socks and shoes. He eventually came back outside and agreed to let police do a walkthrough of his apartment to see if Hannah was physically present. However, she was not, and no evidence was collected from his home at that time. They had already obtained a search warrant for his vehicle, and they were obviously grilling him to give them more information. They told him that they had the warrant for his vehicle and told him that they knew he had been with her. They continued to ask him if he had been with her or if Hannah had been inside his vehicle at any time. To which he replied, um, and then stated that he was going inside his home. While searching Matthew's vehicle, investigators took swab samples from various places in the car. And spoiler alert, they were later able to match DNA recovered from the interior of the passenger side door when they were about to tow the vehicle, Jesse Matthew walked outside, approached several detectives, and asked if he could get paperwork for a passport out of his vehicle. Like, I just have to laugh 
that he thought that they were going to let him get anything out of that car, let alone information for a fucking passport. <laughs> when you're a suspect in an abduction case, Harry Potter and the audacity of this bitch. They told him no, because there might be fingerprints on it, to which Jesse Matthew stated there wouldn't be, because he had just obtained the papers that day, rather than claiming his innocence, and there would not be fingerprints because he did not abduct Hannah. He also refused to provide his cell phone number to police, so that they would later be able to follow up with him. So basically, he just was not cooperating at this point. Search warrants were quickly obtained for his apartment, as well as his mother's home. They collected several items, including his cell phone, which had not been in service since September 13th, which was when Hannah went missing, because he removed the SIM card. And they took a pair of shorts that were apparently found on his bedroom floor, which he was wearing the night of Hannah's disappearance. They contained a stain on the hem area, if you know what I mean. And DNA testing would later go on to confirm that Jesse Matthew was the major contributor to that stain, and Hannah's DNA was a minor contributor. Once investigators were done with their searches, Jesse Matthew's roommate gave him a ride to his mother's house, and later that morning he went and obtained a new license from the DMV. He also went to the bank and withdrew everything but $30 from his account. The following day, so Saturday, September 20th, Jesse walked into the Charlottesville Police Department to meet a detective. However, when they came and tried to speak with him, he refused and asked for an attorney. At that point in time, they did not have enough evidence given the fact that the DNA testing had not come back yet. Despite being legally required to let him leave, they were still able to put surveillance on him. So they had FBI surveillance tailing him everywhere he went. Once he realized this, he began driving recklessly to lose the FBI, which he succeeded in. Due to this, they now had something to arrest him on, and they put out a warrant for Matthew's arrest for two counts of reckless driving. The following day, Jesse Matthew took his sister's car and fled the state of Virginia. Investigators had no idea where he was headed, and the community was outraged that they let him get away, especially given that he had FBI agents that were supposed to be surveilling him. On September 23rd, police charged him with abduction, and his picture and name went to national news. On September 24th, so four days that he had been missing at this point, Jesse Matthew was spotted in Galveston, Texas, by a woman who was simply enjoying some time at the beach. The beach was nearly empty, and she was sitting in the back of her car when she glanced over and spotted the man camping in a tent at the beach. She didn't think much of it at first, until the man drove past her. He kind of stopped in front of her and basically grilled her. And that's when she immediately recognized him. Because there was so much coverage on Hannah's case, and he was considered to be one of the most wanted men in America, she had seen his face all over the news over the past several days. Amazingly, instead of leaving immediately, which is what most people would have done, she stayed, played it cool, and contacted several police departments about the sighting. If she hadn't had done that, who knows where Jesse Matthew would have been today, especially given that he had an atlas in his car with several marked coordinates that he could cross into Mexico from. So the sheriff's office showed up at the scene and were able to arrest Matthew without any issue, and he was eventually transported back to Virginia. Police discovered even more troubling information once they started to interview people that were close to him. The morning after Hannah's disappearance, he had apparently missed his 7.30 a.m. coaches meeting at Covenant High School, where he coached football. That's right, he worked with kids and was continually surrounded by kids the same age, if not younger than Hannah. He was acting incredibly strange. Firstly, he showed up to work late and would not even acknowledge coworkers when they spoke to him. He told people that he was not okay, and he also had a swollen jaw, which he claimed was from a toothache. My guess is that Hannah fought back, and he was not expecting a punch to the face. Hannah was nearly six feet tall and was skinny, but she was athletic, and I'm assuming she was very strong. In the days following her abduction, Matthew became increasingly paranoid and would not leave his apartment or answer any phone calls. Apparently, this behavior was not like him. People that were close to Jesse Matthew described him as a gentle soul, like a big teddy bear and he was quiet and kind. 
The people in his life did not believe that he could be linked to this whatsoever. But what people would later find out is that he was linked to several incidents like this and was essentially living a double life. To those that knew him, he volunteered to coach high school football. He was a nursing assistant at a hospital in Charlottesville. And he used to be a cab driver that would make sure women got home safely. And they had no idea that he had committed at least four sexual assaults, as well as kidnapping and ultimately murder, which DNA would later prove. As time went on, the community and Hannah's parents began to lose hope that she would ever be found alive. Obviously, Jesse Matthew was not talking, but massive searches for Hannah Graham were taking place. They had over 1,500 volunteers, and police were asking farmers in six surrounding counties to check their farms. Sadly, on October 18th, 2014, everyone's worst nightmare became a reality. A search and rescue team located Hannah's remains on an abandoned farm that was, was located in a remote area of Albemarle County, near 3193 Old Lynchburg Road. The area was filled with dense woods behind a vacant home. The crop top that she was wearing the night of her disappearance was inside out and unzipped. Her pants were off, and were located near her remains. One leg was inside out, and the jeans contained a hole in the knee of one leg, and a hole on the hamstring of the other, which were not present the night she disappeared. Her watch was also found near her body, but her undergarments, shoes, and cell phone were never recovered. Hannah's nose was fractured on both sides, and the autopsy determined that she most likely had been suffocated or strangled to death. Essentially, she was found in the same manner that Morgan Harrington was. I want to break away for a minute and discuss a few things about Jesse Matthew and just give a little background about him. So at the time of his arrest, he was 32 years old and grew up in Charlottesville. In high school, he was a popular football player and state champion in wrestling. He eventually got a full ride scholarship to Liberty College and stayed there for two years until he was dismissed from the school because of a rape allegation against a young woman that attended school there. She reported it to the college, but a police report was never filed by the school for that allegation. He then transferred to Christopher Newport University and played football there for a month before being forced to leave school again due to yet again another rape allegation in 2003, which again, he did not suffer any real consequences for because the school never filed an official report. Can you even imagine if he had been held accountable for his actions back in college? Would he have been able to assault the woman in 2005? Would he have been able to abduct, assault, and murder Morgan Harrington and Hannah Graham? And honestly, you guys, there are so, so many cases of missing and murdered women in that area that he could have potentially been linked to. There were gaps in his assaults that we know about. He's a violent, violent offender. He takes whatever the hell he wants. I have to assume there are more that we don't know about. He's not going to admit to them and potentially get the death penalty. Investigators were able to match the DNA from the Fairfax case, Morgan Harrington's murder, and now Hannah Graham's. And they thankfully solved all three cases and got this sick bitch before he could hurt another girl. They discovered that he was a former cab driver and was on duty the night Morgan Harrington disappeared. And if you watched my previous video, you know why that's so important. She was essentially stranded three hours away from home. And I believe he was in his cab, lined up with other cabs in the Lanigan parking lot when he saw Morgan walking and decided to approach her. Even more so because a woman that he picked up the night before later came forward, stating that Matthew approached her and asked her if she needed a ride. She told him that she didn't have money for a cab, and he offered to give her a ride in exchange for a sexual favor, which thankfully she declined. I don't think that would be something that Morgan would do either, but is it possible that she told him she had no cash, and he offered to take her to the ATM just down the road from where she was spotted? And unfortunately in Hannah's case, he saw a young girl that was vulnerable and took it as an opportunity because he is completely and totally a predator. 
He treated women like they were prey. Jesse Matthew Jr. was charged with each woman's case separately. So in September of 2014, he was charged with Hannah Graham's murder. In the following month, he was indicted on the 2005 sexual assault against RG. And then in February of 2015, he was charged with Morgan Harrington's murder. In October of 2015, a year after he was charged, Jesse Matthew received three life sentences for RG's sexual assault after he used the Alpha plea, which for those that don't know, this basically means that he is not admitting to the crime, but agrees that the prosecution has enough evidence against him to get a conviction. In March of 2016, he pled guilty to two counts of first degree murder, one for Morgan and one for Hannah, as well as two counts of abduction with intent to defile for both of the girls. It did not go to trial, because Jesse Matthew agreed to a plea deal. Basically, this meant that he would spend life in prison and would not receive the death penalty if he agreed to the condition that there would be no chance for early release, parole eligibility, or geriatric release, which he would have been eligible for in RG's case. If he would have received geriatric release, he would have been eligible for it at the age of 60, which means he could have potentially been released after only serving 27 years. One thing that I'd like to mention is that Jesse Matthew Jr. was recently diagnosed with stage four colon cancer that has spread to other parts of his body. He was transferred to a state prison to receive treatments for his cancer, which maybe I'm gonna sound heartless, but that just sounds like a waste of tax dollars in my opinion. I mean, people that don't commit rapes and murders aren't getting cancer treatment for free. And I think he got exactly what he deserved. He changed the lives of every one of these women or ended the lives of these women. He changed their families' lives forever. He changed his own family's lives forever for selfish reasons because he took whatever he wanted and he had no regard for anyone else. Honestly, what a waste. And one last thing, to his ex that wrote a heartfelt letter to the court claiming that he shouldn't be held responsible and he shouldn't have life in prison because he was sexually abused as a child, I hope a predator like this never encounters your daughter. RG moved back to India and has a few young children now. She's trying to move forward and heal from everything she endured. Morgan Harrington's parents are doing some amazing things. They actually started a nonprofit organization called Help Save the Next Girl, and they do everything they can to spread information and promote personal safety. They've held rallies to bring awareness to women's issues on college campuses. They've been very supportive of Hannah Graham's parents, as well as other families that have been forced to go through the same thing they did. The Harringtons also have other projects that they work with as a way to honor Morgan. In case you missed it in my last video, Morgan had aspirations to become a teacher. So her family developed several educational projects to honor that, including the Morgan Harrington Educational Wing at Omni Village in Zambia, Africa. Because of this, she has played a part in teaching more children than she ever would have been able to had she gone on to become a teacher. The University of Virginia built a memorial on campus in Hannah Graham's honor, and the World Bank holds an annual award to reduce violence against young women. Her family has said that Hannah Graham wanted to change the world, and despite it being in a way that no one ever anticipated, she did just that. If it weren't for her, I know for a fact that Jesse Matthew would have had more victims and more young women's lives would have been cut short at his hands. Hannah is a hero. Hannah Graham stopped a serial killer. But that's it for me today, guys. As always, remember the name, Casey Shane. I'm out.